All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our webcast today. Is your software supply chain secure? Uh, before I hand you off to Mike and Greg, just a couple of things I need to cover. First, if you have questions along the way, and we always hope that you do, please use the questions box under the GoToWebinar control panel. Just type them right in there. Uh, Vaughn's also going to be monitoring those uh, for me along the way. Um, if for some reason we don't get through everything, I, I know the guys have a lot of stuff to cover today. I'll make sure that we capture everything uh, that, that they need to, to follow up with you after. We are recording the session as well. That's why your lines are all muted. The replay will be available either later today or tomorrow morning out in the Endeavor community. And the last thing for me is that we want to make sure these sessions are valuable so that there's a short uh, post-event survey that's going to pop up on the screen after we close. If you could stick around and give us some feedback, we would all appreciate it. That's it for me. Take it away, Mike. All right. Thanks, Len. And hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our webcast, Is Your Software Supply Chain Secure? I'm Michael Bauer, Product Manager at Broadcom, and I'll be presenting this webcast along with Greg McKinnon, Distinguished Engineer, also of Broadcom. So the agenda for today, we'll start by discussing some recent government directives around improving cybersecurity. I'll then turn it over to Greg to discuss what is a software supply chain, as well as some strategies to secure it. Then I'll come, it'll come back to me and I'll discuss some recent software supply chain compromises of significant scale. Then I'll talk about how software supply chain security is relevant to mainframe. And finally, we'll sh showcase a solution that allows you to adopt software supply chain security best practices uh, for mainframe. So let's get started by discussing some of these uh, recent government directives. There were government directives around improving cybersecurity from both the US as well as the EU. The key bullet points here are particularly in, uh, in terms of the US executive order on improving the nation's uh, cybersecurity. Um, so the first bullet point, um, it's pretty obvious, we need to adopt security best practices. But what are those security best practices? These include things like having an incident response plan. So when a cybersecurity event or incident is in motion, we have a plan in place to mitigate it effectively. It includes things like adopting uh, technologies like multi-factor authentication to make it harder for um, attackers to access more critical systems and information. And it also includes adopting uh, best practices and methodologies like zero trust architecture. The key point of zero trust architecture is assume that your organization, that your data center has already been infiltrated. Given that the attacker is already inside your network, what can you do to limit the blast radius of that cyber attack, that cyber incidents? Well, one key thing you can do is provide least privileged access. Implement fine-grained access controls around critical data, around critical systems, so that even if someone's inside your network, the blast radius of that, that event is, is minimal. The uh, directive, the executive order, also talks about streamlining access to cybersecurity data between both private and public organizations. It also talks about establishing a cyber safety review board that has the ability to meet after cyber incidents as cyber incidences occur and they can retrospect and adapt their incident response plans uh, based on these meetings. This is something we've done in software development for a long time, having retrospectives and iterating on our processes to improve things going forward. They're applying these same concepts to cybersecurity. The executive order also notes a need to invest in technology like MFA that I mentioned earlier, but also personnel to match these modernization goals. Uh, this might be hiring properly trained staff or training the staff that you already have more. And finally, it talks about automate, 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 and the importance of automation in being able to respond to cyber incidents quickly, efficiently, and consistently. And finally, it goes in great detail on discussing the needs to secure your software supply chain, which is what we'll be discussing throughout the remainder of the presentation. And in regards to uh, responding to the directive, 
from the executive order on improving the software supply chain security, Broadcom is front and center. And we're leveraging these tools, some of these tools we'll show today, and definitely adopting the best practices we'll show today for the software we're delivering to all of you. But even beyond that, we want to provide these tools to you so that you can leverage uh, them in your own uh, internal software supply chain or across uh, all your products. So with that, I'll turn it over to Greg to talk a little bit more about software supply chain as well as strategies to secure it. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, let's take a moment here and look at four use cases. Now these four use cases we believe have a lot of value for our uh, Broadcom MSD customers, as well as for Broadcom MSD itself. And all of these use cases are in a support of better cyber resiliency. So being resilient means having the capacity to either withstand or to detect and recover quickly from some difficulties. Now, difficulties in this context means uh, software has been compromised or the software supply chain producing the software has been compromised. I'd also uh, point out that all four of these use cases depend on something characterized here as secure, trustworthy data produced by a software supply chain. Now, I'll define more specifically what that data is in, in just a bit, but just bear in mind as we go through these that all of them depend on this kind of data. Now, the first use case, very simply put, is anybody who wants to use software should be able to figure out for themselves whether it's safe to use. In today's world, with the increasing number of cyber attacks on software supply chains resulting in compromised software, this is, this is vital, this is essential. To use software without being able to determine independently for yourself that it's safe really takes the risk right off the chart. It, it, you need to have some uh, ability to determine for yourself that the software is safe before you use it. This is essential. Uh, the second case has to do with things from a software producer's perspective. Software producers have a keen interest in knowing and being able to verify that the software and how they produce it have integrity. That is, both things haven't been compromised. In fact, there may come a day when software producers have to produce such evidence that prove such things. Now, the third and fourth cases um, are complementary and go hand in glove. The third case has to do with using this same kind of data to drive automated policy decisions. And moreover, to shift those policy decisions left into your software supply chain so that each and every step of your software supply chain can be a policy decision point. This is extremely powerful and really enhances your ability to achieve some meaningful degree of software supply chain security. The fourth case is really an elaboration on that in the sense that given what I just described about three, use case four is just saying that Given that technique, you can move your organization towards continuous ongoing compliance as your software supply chain operates. You don't then have to take stock of such things sort of on a periodic basis, but you can do it on an ongoing continuous basis. And this really strengthens your security posture with respect to your software and your software supply chain. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so what we see here are two supply chains. Uh, the top one, a traditional one, producing Tylenol, and the bottom one being a software supply chain, producing some sort of deployed system. Now, both have the same overarching goal, to get a product to a customer. And while certainly tools, techniques, materials, so on, in one supply chain versus the other will undoubtedly differ, the basic patterns and the basic idea is the same. In both cases, you take in some raw materials, some other inputs, combine them in certain ways, transform them, test them, quality assure them, package them, get them, to, get them to some customer. So both kinds of supply chains have a lot in common. And moreover, uh, they have something else very important that's in common, and that is both have come under attack in the real world as, as you all know from the news we've seen over the past number of years. In fact, some of you may have been impacted by some of these attacks. So with respect to software supply chains, what can we do to better withstand or to detect and quickly recover from difficulties you know, that relate to compromise and software we want to use and the software supply chains producing them? Let's, let's take a look. Now, we'll look at this chart 
uh, in, in a bit of detail in just a moment, but I just want to circle back and just emphasize something that Mike mentioned about the U.S. executive order, and in particular, the security considerations he cited. It's absolutely essential that uh, security best practices are taken serious here, uh, seriously here, in, the, in, in terms of things like adopting zero trust architecture or employing multi-factor authentication and using the principle of least privilege, all these things Mike uh, mentioned. And other things too, you, making sure your organization has some secure software development lifecycle best practices in place, or folding in things like some cybersecurity best practices around threat modeling or pen testing. All these things and some other things besides really help establish that strong security posture, that strong security foundation, a bedrock really that uh, software supply chain security rests upon. Without it, it'd be very difficult to achieve any meaningful, effective uh, degree of software supply chain security. So with respect to software supply chain security, we, we, we think it depends on something we're, we've characterized here as an integrity model. And there are two key aspects. There's transparency and verifiable integrity through something called an attestation. Now, transparency, simply put, is you need to have visible insight into the software and how it's being produced. This is absolutely essential today. Uh, without this, uh, this insight, you're flying blind, and that's just it's too risky in today's world. So you need to have this visible transparency into what's in the software as a consumer in particular. And, and in some cases, uh, think about use case too, you really wanna have some evidence that proves that the software supply chain also has integrity. This is extremely valuable information, but it's only as valuable as it is trustworthy. And if you can't trust it, it's useless at the very least, and it may moreover be pretty dangerous because it could be misleading. It could lead you to believe something is safe to use, and in fact, it may not be. So for how can we trust this valuable information? Well, that can be achieved through using something called an attestation. So Let's take a look at that. We'll look at both aspects in turn. With respect to uh, transparency and visibility into software, of course, the Software Bill of Materials, or SBOM, comes readily to mind. It's really the label on the software. It enables this kind of transparency, thereby decreasing risk. Uh, it tells you what's inside the software, um, first-party components third-party components. And through that lens, you can see vulnerabilities that are related to these components. You can learn about uh, licensing concerns and considerations, or suppliers and supplier names, and, and a host of other things. All this information provides this vitally important transparent insight and visibility into what's in the software. It's essential and, and, and a necessary uh, a thing to have, this label on the software. Now, analogously, here's our buddy uh, Tylenol making another appearance. This is the Tylenol package label. And for someone who wants to consume Tylenol, this is vitally important. It tells that consumer things like drug facts, directions, what the ingredients are, warnings. This stuff is essentially, it's vitally important to anyone who wants to take and consume a Tylenol pill. Someone may have an allergy and needs to be able to determine independently whether it's safe to take this pill. So in both of these cases, these labels are essential and necessary, and yet um, insufficient. Now, a story about Tylenol from 1982 in the Chicago land area of the United States uh, is, provides an illustration of why uh, it's, these labels are insufficient. Uh, this, this is a story you folks may well be familiar with, but it's apropos here. Um, in 1982, some guy uh, laced some Tylenol pills with potassium cyanide. And these pills made it onto the shelf in some Tylenol bottles out in the Chicagoland area. And some uns unsuspecting customers uh, bought some of these bottles. And in fact, odds are some of these customers looked at the label on the bottle and figured, okay, this is how you use the pill, look safe, I'm gonna take one. And some of these people did indeed take some of these laced pills. And of course the consequences were, were catastrophic. You know, Some people lost their lives. So, as we know, Tylenol, in the wake of this, introduced the tamper-evident 
uh, cap and seal, which we're all very familiar with today. And this puts the Tylenol consumer, of course, in a much stronger position. The Tylenol consumer, you know, think about use case one, uh, can look at this Tylenol bottle and determine whether there's any evidence of tampering. And if not, then that puts the consumer in a much stronger position. Now they can, they can decide to trust this label that's describing what's in the Tylenol pill because it hasn't been tampered with. Now the same, the same concern and considerations apply to a software bill of materials and the software it describes. You need to be able to trust what that SBOM label is telling you about the software. It's vitally important to have that insight into what's in the software because it allows you to decrease risk around using that software. But how can we trust what the SBOM is telling us? Well, an attestation is the way we can do that. Let's take a look. Now, as probably you've all sussed out by now, and attestation is this secure, trustworthy data I uh, talked about on the use case chart. Um, now, we're going to look at this uh, chart in some detail in just a moment, especially the colorful structure, data structure at the top, in particular the yellow box in the middle there, and we'll look at some other examples on the bottom right. Um, but first, I want to introduce a, a definition of attestation. An attestation is a cryptographically signed statement that claims something is true about another thing. Well, you know, it's kind of abstract, so let's ground it a bit in our SBOM example. An SBOM attestation is a cryptographically signed statement that claims an SBOM is true about a software artifact. That's a very useful thing to, to be able to rely on that what the SBOM label is telling you about the software is actually true and accurate about the software artifact. And the way um, this can work is if you look at this colorful data structure at the top, this is the Entoto attestation model. And there are a bunch of details there, but let's just focus on the yellow box in the middle, the attestation statement, because it, it relates to the definition we're, we're using here. So an SBOM attestation would affect would in effect be taking some hash that you know, uniquely identifies and describes this software artifact and making that the subject of the attestation. And the SBOM becomes the predicate. So you bind them together in this attestation. And in, and in practice, this is generated as a, as a JSON document. And, and these elements are bound together in this JSON document. And then you sign this document. So in effect, you put a tamper evident cap and seal on this JSON document, this SBOM attestation. Now that puts the software consumer in a much superior position. You know, think about uh, the Tylenol analogy and also it harkened back to use case one. Uh, a software consumer then can look at this SBOM attestation and decide whether or not they trust who, who signed it. And can also determine independently as well that whether or not any of this has been tampered with or changed since it was signed. Now, if if the consumer is satisfied uh, with respect to those things, then the consumer is in a position to trust that the SBOM is truly and accurately depicting what's in that software. And then the software consumer can decide whether the software looks safe to use uh, to run their business. This is extremely powerful. And as, as I've underscored, it's essential in today's world to have this capability as a software consumer. <clears throat> but that's not the true story with respect to attestations. In some cases, uh, and this is where we'll talk about some of the examples on the bottom right. Um, in some cases, and think of use case two here, where a software producer may need to provide proof that their software supply chain is trustworthy and hasn't been compromised. In such cases, some additional evidence is required beyond an SBOM attestation, which, as we've discussed, provides some verifiable proof that the software label truly and accurately depicts what's in the software. Now, to establish that the steps in a software supply chain are trustworthy, that is, haven't been tampered with, additional attestations are required. In effect, these are verifiable claims about any aspect of how a piece of software was produced. These attestations form a body of evidence, sort of a chain of evidence that attests to the fact that the software supply chain itself hasn't been tampered with and is itself trustworthy. Now on the bottom right, we see some possibilities to consider here. 
For example, you may want to capture a signed commit as an attestation when code is introduced or updated in an SCM, uh, or a build provenance attestation. This captures information related to how the build step was accomplished in your software supply chain. So for example, it can capture as evidence things around where did the input parameters come from, the source materials, uh, what tool chain was used, who built it, where was it built, what environment was it built on, when was it built, provides evidence of the integrity of that build step. You could do the same for the testing step, packaging step, and so forth. <clears throat> Again, these provide verifiable claims that a supply chain steps are trustworthy and therefore that the supply chain itself is, is, uh, is worth trusting. Now, this helps provide confidence that a set of inputs led to a particular set of outputs, for example, a software package or artifact or an SBOM itself. So let's look at a quick example then uh, that shows us a really simple workflow that sort of illustrates uh, an SBOM attestation in action. So we see by now our good buddy on the upper uh, right sporting a tamper evident cap and seal. And in, in, in some sense, an SBOM attestation or any attestation is like having a tamper evident cap and seal on some data that you really need to trust and rely on. In this simple workflow, we see two open source tools here, SIFT and SIGSTORE COSIGN. And this workflow, some client is using SIFT to pull a container image from the registry generate an SBOM and an attestation. The SBOM being the label describing what's in the container image and the attestation this client wants to use to uh, protect this information um, and to bind the uh, SBOM with the you know, hash of the container image. And in fact, it's using the same attestation model we saw on the previous page, which is the Intoto attestation model. These things are generated and then uh, SIG store cosigns used to sign it. So you put that tamper evident cap and seal on that attestation, goes back in the container registry as a JSON document. Consumer downstream can be interested in this container image and then fetch the attestation, look at it, can determine for themselves whether they trust who signed it, can determine independently whether anything has been changed or has been tampered with since it was signed. And if those things are satisfactory, the consumer can then trust that that SBOM, that, that software label, is telling them something that's true and accurate about that uh, software artifact, in this case, the container image, and then decide whether this container image is safe to use for whatever policies uh, they need to adhere to within their organization. And um, so that's, that's a simple workflow that sort of illustrates the usage of an SBOM and how you can uh, consume and, and verify one. So this chart's just meant to visually express uh, the two aspects we've just been talking about, transparency and verifiable integrity uh, using att attestations to build this body of evidence, this chain of evidence-based trust. So in the middle there, that blue and orange arrowy thing is really just a sort of a uh, software supply chain with some common steps in there. But I wanna draw your attention to the top edge. This is that body of evidence, that chain of evidence-based trust that the software supply chains produced, SBOM attestations uh, attesting to that the software is as advertised, uh, and, and the ver some various other attestations that we touched on. It provides some evidence that steps within the software supply chain are also trustworthy you know, commits, builds, tests, packaging, et cetera. Next chart, please. This is really the same software supply chain in terms of the steps that are shown at the bottom in the blue boxes uh, of common steps. And, uh, and along the bottom, you see those words that are uh, examples of uh, attestations that might be generated by the software supply chain. You'll notice they're going into an evidence store and that can be used to capture some immutable record of the, all the evidence the supply chains produced and that can be very useful to drive offline compliance and auditing use cases. But the thing I wanna highlight here is that that same data, and this really is an illustration of use cases three and four around policy automation and continuous compliance. This same uh, trustworthy data, these attestations can be used to drive policy automation. That's illustrated here with that policy governance enforcer. That's really a policy automation engine. And you can see that engine's consuming some rules, getting them out of some SCM, 
and then evaluating them against this, these attestations, this trustworthy data coming out of the software supply chain. And you'll notice that at each step, there's a policy decision point, which means that you've shifted this concern left into your software supply chain so that each and every step, you can take stock of whether what's happening in that step has integrity um, and, and what's happening in that step is trustworthy. Uh, this is a very powerful thing. If anything uh, seems fishy or has, it doesn't comply with policy, any step along the way, you can in effect like pull the and on cord and just stop things dead in its tracks. This is a very powerful paradigm. And it, it relies on something called policies code where you express your policies in a code-like way where you can source control, manage them, and you get a lot of goodness there. But you also get the goodness from being able to shift this concern into your software supply chain and evaluate policies using this trustworthy data in each and every step. This puts you in a best, but much better position of one, detecting and recovering quickly from any issues that might arise. But secondly, it puts you in a stronger position of uh, ensuring that uh, software that may have been compromised doesn't escape your software supply chain. Uh, next chart, please, Mike. And this chart is just meant to sort of bring all this together, it's just to sort of emphasize that taking a holistic approach here is really important if you want to achieve a better cyber resiliency posture, you know, being able to withstand as much as possible, uh, but also to detect and recover as quickly as possible from any sort of uh, difficulties or compromise. And so just to recap, starting at the bottom, you have that security bedrock, that strong security foundation comprised of the various things Mike mentioned that I, and I emphasized. Um, you have that you know, typical looking software supply chain in the middle. And again, along the top edge, that body of evidence, that chain of evidence uh, comprised of those attestations that the software supply chain produced, SBOMs, commits, build provenance, et cetera. And those can be verified and validated at each and every step of the software supply chain using this shift left policy automation and continuous compliance technique that we've been talking about. That really strengthens your position and helps you ensure you have a, a strong, resilient uh, software supply chain security posture. And that's it for me. I'm going to turn it by, back to Mike now, who will uh, take us through to the end. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so what I'd like to discuss now is some recent software supply chain compromises and attacks of significant scale. And I'd like to highlight along the way how some of the key strategies that Greg outlined would have either prevented these attacks from occurring or allowed uh, the attack to be mitigated more effectively. So we'll kick off with the log4j compromise. This is probably one of the most infinite uh, vulnerabilities of, of all time, uh, infamous vulnerabilities of all time. And I'm sure a lot of folks had to, had to deal with this event. Um, but in, in case you haven't or, or maybe aren't fully aware of the log4j compromise, I wanted to illustrate its impact in a fairly simple way. And <clears throat> when I was looking to do that, I, I thought about this old XKCD comic on the left. But in order to fully appreciate the, uh, the comic, you kind of have to understand how modern software is built. So a lot of Java applications, Python applications, Node applications, they're an assembly of disparate software modules. So there's all these third-party dependencies that are combined, additional business value is added, and then you have a new piece of software. And you can think of each one of these disparate modules as one of these blocks making up this, uh, this structure on the left. And here you can see it says all modern digital infrastructure is ultimately you know, supported by some project a uh, random person in Nebraska has been, been thank, thanklessly maintaining since, since 2003. And that, you know, showing that, you know, maybe this is all, all, all brittle to some extent. Now, Log4j wasn't exactly the same in that it was a highly used and maintained package. It had a lot of provenance. It was underneath the Apache Foundation, but nonetheless, um, it was used in a lot of modern digital infrastructure, modern applications, and then it, a significant vulnerability was found. And this was really represented, um, really represented the state of the, the ecosystem. But when I was looking for this XKCD comic, I actually happened upon this site, housemark.co.uk, and they captured some commentary from, from the public on, on Twitter at the time. And the, the first comment really stuck out to me because I'm a car enthusiast, and they said, 
Uh, this is how I would explain it. Imagine a specific kind of bolt used in most cars uh, has to has to be replaced. Or you just imagine the impact. Certainly, we've all or a lot of us have had a, a recall on our vehicle from time to time, but this sort of situation would impact all vehicles and 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 be quite quite an impact. But I I I thought the response to this tweet was even better. Um, Matt said, uh, I went with, imagine they suddenly discovered scotch tape suddenly explodes, all right? So what do you do? You, you throw out all your scotch tape rolls, but then you think about it and you're like, huh, I got sc scotch tape holding pictures to my fridge. I got scotch tape holding a, a broken page in a textbook um, that I haven't opened since 2015. And then you're like, oh, I actually broke the battery case on the back of a calculator. So I have I have uh, scotch tape holding that together. And then, then you get really worried and you're trying to find everywhere scotch tape is through, throughout your house, but you, you forgot about that scotch tape on the back of the battery case and, and that's in your junk drawer. And, and suddenly that explodes and, and your whole house is on fire, right? I mean, that's a very vivid example, but it, it's, it's relatable to the Log4j uh, compromise. So let's dig into that a little bit more. So what exactly happened? Well, Log4j was a logging package that could write to system files, and it was heavily adopted by Java applications, and it was present throughout the industry. And then much later, they found out there was a vulnerability in that package. Um, and a, a, another big issue here that caused such a big impact was the significance of the vulnerability. So the vulnerability, in essence, was a remote code execution vulnerability and it would allow the attacker to run code essentially on the system so the blast radius of a particular attack wasn't limited to the application it was the whole system that the application was running on you didn't have to be an authenticated user to do the exploit and you just had to have an internet connection it checked all the boxes to be receive a maximum critical vulnerability score of, of 10. So definitely a very um, significant vulnerability and definitely very widespread. So at this time, once the vulnerability was identified and even when a fix was, was made available, the race was on, right? The, the folks trying to protect their systems knew at approximately the same time as the, uh, the attackers who were trying to exploit this now known vulnerability. So what could organizations have done to minimize the impact of Log4j? They could have taken uh, software bill of materials that describes these third party artifacts, these third party dependencies and loaded them into a monitoring solution so that when an incident like Log4j happens, they know exactly where it is in their organization. I will discuss more on that uh, a bit later, but it, I, I'm sure a lot of us had sort of the experience of folks kind of running around and asking everyone, where's Log4j? Are you using Log4j? Is that in your applications? And having a standard monitoring tool would help you implement a better incident response plan. So just returning briefly to the comparison of traditional supply chain to software supply chain, this attack was in the ingredients that made up software. It was in the third party dependencies. And this is the attack vector um, we saw with, with Log4j. The next one I wanna talk about was a very sophisticated attack on SolarWinds Orion. So SolarWinds Orion was a system infrastructure monitoring product. So it ran with high authority in the um, client's environment. And what ended up transpiring is the attackers were able to put malware on a build system that just before compilation time was able to inject some uh, files. And this is an important aspect because at compilation time, that's when code goes from human readable to machine readable. So it's much harder to diagnose um, after, that, after that point. And essentially they injected a back door into their software so that any customer who was running this product and was connected to the public internet could be uh, basically, basically attacked. Two key organizations, 
that were attacked as part of this, as part of the impact. One was the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's actually underneath the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So they, in a in a way, sort of knocked in knocked in the front door, uh, which also brought to light the need for you know some of these executive orders that came came about discussing software supply chain security. But they also uh, breached FireEye, and FireEye is a well-known cybersecurity firm, and they were actually the ones who led the sort of root cause analysis and, and found out where the where the problem lied. But when they were breached, unfortunately, um, the attack the attacker was able to um, steal their arsenal of uh, hacking tools that they use to protect. Uh, their make sure they're protecting their their customers' environments. So that was definitely another another bad aspect. And that now that the attacker, the bad guy, has more more tools that he can use in in the future. So what could Solar Winds have done to prevent this attack? Well, given that the attacker was able to install malware on the build system, the best they could have done is govern the provenance of that build system, govern the integrity of that build system, make sure that uh, things like you know malware couldn't be uh, installed or if there was a significant difference in the build environment, being able to, to detect that. But along the lines of SolarWinds, Orion, another key aspect of this and why it was really hard to catch and why it, you know, it ended up taking a long time to resolve this issue, so the response was slow, is that the attackers were very, very patient. Just a little bit of an overview of this, this attack. It was in September that the threat actor first accessed SolarWinds uh, and, and got onto their build environment. And they basically did a test run. So I mentioned that they had malware that injected a backdoor, but before they did that, they just had malware that injected some do nothing code, basically check the processor architecture on which SolarWinds was, was running. And the significance of that is then they saw that change in a downstream product. Um, we talked about the tamper-proof seal, but in a way, in this case, they got underneath this seal. And they saw that. So they, they returned three months later, a little bit over three months later. Um, well, that's actually from the end of the test injection period. So it's actually, they started in September. They returned in February, so about five months later. And they had more sophisticated malware that injected this back door and it went out to customers as part of a software update. Um, and then it took much another another nine months till December to really find the the root cause. And a couple of things that made it challenging was that the threat actor removed their malware from the build system, making it harder to identify that aspect of it. And uh, the uh, network, since it was a backdoor and they accessed over a network, they bounced it off of servers running in the US, so it made it harder to detect that way. And they were sort of mimic, mim mimicking the, um, the syntax of internal Orion messaging, so that also made it difficult. But the point here is the attackers had a lot of patience, and it was a very hard to identify, um, so it had been very important to uh, really monitor the integrity of your, your build environments. And again, just to illustrate where this attack came, it was in the factory. It was in the build system that created the artifact that was later deployed to customers. And the last attack I want to touch base on is the CodeCov attack. Uh, so for CodeCov, um, CodeCov is a code coverage tool that's typically run in CI environments. Um, and what the attack was is that the threat actor was able to obtain a credential from a CodeCov Docker image, and then they used this credential to modify a file. It's called a batch uploader script. And they only added two lines to that file. One line, or, or the line basically extracted all the um, environment variables and uploaded them to their um, server. And the significance of this is since it's running in a continuous integration environment, lots of sensitive information is stored in those environment variables. Um, so they were able to collect a lot of a lot of sensitive data. It took two months before the issue was found. And how it was actually found was a customer of the Bash uploader script checked the file hash published on CodeCov's repository, saw the mismatch, reported the incident, and then CodeCov corrected the problem. So what could CodeCov have 
done to prevent the attack, or they could have likely prevented the attack if they had multi-factor authentication involved in their in their um, code editing process or their publishing process, because just the one credential alone wouldn't have allowed the the threat actor in. Um, but if if we assume they were, you know, they didn't have MFA and they were able to get get in, then um, they could have monitored what they had on their um, basically application repository location and check the file hashes periodically to make sure nothing had had changed, which is what organizations could have also done to prevent being compromised. Just check the file hash of the thing you're deploying to make sure what you're deploying is actually what you think you're deploying and not it hasn't been compromised. So I highlighted two areas of the supply chain for this attack. One, the application repository is really where this, this attack was because you could see the file hash had changed the, and in a way that's similar to a, some sort of seal it had been broken. Um, so you would know not to deploy that to your systems. But if you deployed it to your system, I also highlighted build system engineers because that's where the um, attack itself was directed. It wanted to get these, uh, uh, environment variables running in CI environments um, back to their 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 server. So now that we've discussed these attacks, I want to briefly cover some of uh, some strategies that would have either eliminated the attacks, prevented them from occurring, or allowed organizations to resolve them uh, more quickly. The first is the software bill of materials that Greg outlined describes third-party dependencies, uh, the licenses involved in that software, the supplier name, and also the it would describe the, the file hashes of the artifacts that you're deploying. So because of that part, it would have prevented the CodeCov attack. We could have checked the digital signature of the SBOM document itself. Then we could have checked the file hashes of the artifacts we were deploying, and we would have chose not to deploy them because they wouldn't have passed a policy check. We could also take these software bill of materials and we could load them into a monitoring tool like dependency track. So when something like log4j happens or we find out scotch tape suddenly explodes, we can find out where that scotch tape is, where that vulnerability is within our organization. So it would tell us, you know, we have the CVE, it's related to this component, this application, and we'd be able to update those appropriately. So this would have mitigated the, the, the significance of the log4j vulnerability in that you were able to respond uh, more quickly and respond before the uh, threat actors were able to expose that vulnerability. And lastly, we need a solution for the uh, SolarWinds Orion attack. So we need an attestation of our build environment essentially, but this goes to Greg's earlier point where you know, we may have attestations even beyond what's in a software bill of materials. You know, here, we're, we, we would attest to the material, the first party code, you know, maybe we were checking signed commits, things of that nature. We could have a process attestation, only certain compilers are allowed to be used uh, for this application, checking the integrity of those compilers. Our whole build environment, checking the integrity of that, making sure it hasn't been compromised. And then of course, an artifact attestation that could be included in the, in the software bill of materials. So these were all distributed um, examples of attacks. So how is this how is this relevant to mainframe? Well, mainframe is certainly not immune from attack. We build software there. Uh, some of this software has third-party dependencies, um, and when it's being delivered, um, you know, it might sit in a store and you know an artifactory location or or somewhere internally for a period of time before you deploy it. And while it's sitting there, it can certainly be compromised, just like things would be compromised in your in your store, like the example with with Tylenol. Perhaps someone you know would take it off the shelf. But you can check that seal. You want to check that tamper-proof seal to make sure that you're not being impacted. So these definitely still apply to mainframe. Two key use cases, just to reiterate, um, you want to be able to verify that the software hasn't been compromised, and you also want to be able to inspect its third-party dependencies to make sure you're you're satisfied uh, with that risk, that it meets your, your risk tolerances. The other uh, piece related to this is we wanna follow the same standards 
when bringing cybersecurity best practices to mainframe. Because if your organization, if your chief information security officer is looking at addressing uh, cybersecurity requirements, regulations, um, they can apply the same technology they're using to secure their distributed software supply chain to mainframe. And finally, there's an expectation based on these executive orders and government directives that SBOMs will be delivered alongside all software. There won't be, won't be any exceptions to that. So now that we understand you know, some examples of attacks, how you know, SBOM, software bill materials, is a key aspect in preventing a, a portion of those attacks, um, I wanna talk about a utility we're, we're making available uh, to help bring this to mainframe. So this utility is called SBOMZ. It's a software bill of materials generation tool for ZOS. It allows you to describe ZOS artifacts in an SBOM. You can point it to any ZOS data set, USS file. You can also point it to um, Endeavor locations. So if you're developing a application as part of Endeavor and you want to keep an, keep an SBOM with it as you promote it towards production environment alongside the software, you can certainly do that. Um, it also works with our uh, team build uh, project as well. It supports digitally signing SBOMs. So again, that's your tamper-proof seal. Make sure the SBOM itself hasn't been modified. We leverage the industry standard SPDX and Cyclone DX formats so that you can integrate with tools like Dependency Track that I showed earlier. And SBOMZ is available to our customers as part of Endeavor. It's available on all supported versions of Endeavor, 18.0, 18.1, and 19.0. It's also packaged with Team Build for convenience. And if you uh, if you haven't seen a SBOM document before, uh, it looks like this on the right. This is a snippet from an actual software bill of materials generated from an Endeavor project. And we'll, we'll go through an example of this in just a moment. So if you want to learn more about this or you want a quick reference to mainframe software supply chain security and uh, strategies uh, that you should, should, should leverage, I would encourage you to check out this blog, Is Your so Mainframe Software Supply Chain Secure, on the modern mainframe blog site on medium.com. And we're actually going to jump over there for an example and, uh, for, for a moment. I'm going to walk through how to get started with SBOMZ and also show you it in action securing the software supply chain. So let's, um, let's transition over to that for a moment. Okay, so here's a link to the blog. You can get a lot of information you need right, right here. And I'm gonna use this as the, the foundation for the remainder of the, the presentation. Uh, but you can certainly go here. It's a great great reference article if you wanna uh, run this by others in your, in your organization. Um, it covers a lot of the topics that uh, I brought up in today's, in today's webcast. Um, there's a video in here that shows it, uh, our SBOMZ tool in action, which I'm going to pull up in, in just a moment. But it also links to our documentation on how to get started with, with SBOMZ. So I'm actually going to start there before I go into the, in, into the video in a couple moments, just to show you sort of end-to-end -end how, how you would get started. So the first thing is you would want to install SBOMZ. SBOMZ is a very simple tool to to install and i know maybe you've heard that a lot but it's just simply a, a a binary you put on uss you add that uh to your path or you just install it somewhere your path's already looking and then you can run sbomz commands it's a cli tool that runs on on uss so a typical use case here to get started is if you just wanted to create a software bill of materials that describes a zos uh, data set or uss file um, you would just SSH into that system, um, and then you could run SBOMZ commands. Uh, so one aspect of this is you can generate the keys right within SBOMZ for the uh, for signing the SBOM itself. But then essentially to generate the SBOM, you can just run SBOMZ generic SBOM, point it to the particular PDS you want to include, or the particular USS file you want to include, or both, um, a path to your your private key to sign it and then you can put it in a, a well-named SBOM document. And it comes out in JSON format. This is an example of a Cyclone DX format um, here, um, but you can see it really describes what we, were, what we were pointing it at. Now, this is just simple for pointing it to you know, standard PDS or a, um, a Unix file, 
but we also, and then you can validate the signature. So that means like if somebody after the fact goes and tries to change this tutorial SBOM JSON, they go edit that, the, the, the signature is gonna fail after that point. Um, and you will know that you'll be able to do a policy check on that. The other bit here is you can generate it from an Endeavor location. So here I'm doing an SBOM Z Endeavor SBOM and I'm specifying a specific Endeavor environment, system, subsystem, et cetera. Um, I can also filter it based on data sets. So I might have all my outputs and something dot load line. And then you can add additional information to your SBOM. We talked about other things being in there like supplier, maybe the application name, um, maybe the version of the application. Uh, we've also put license uh, text or, or a link to a, to a standard license in, in there as well. So those are some, some considerations. Um, and then you get a SBOM format that, that looks like this. And this is similar to the one I was showing on the, on the slide. Now, best practices for SBOMs is to um, essentially, you can include this in an Endeavor processor. Again, we're just running a, um, a CLI command on USS. So you can run this over BPX batch and you can specify exactly what you want to include. Um, you could also point it to a, a configuration file, which, which I'll show in a moment to generate this. Um, and then essentially it will generate your, your SBOM as part of that Endeavor processor. Um, so with that, let's jump into just a quick uh, about six, seven minute demonstration here. So uh, I'm just in an Endeavor uh, repository here. And uh, essentially, I want to show our processors here. So we've created this uh, generate processor, gmani. And what it will do is it will invoke the uh, SBOM Z utility and it'll generate uh, an, an SBOM. So when we run a generate on our manifest file, it will create a new SBOM for our project. We also mentioned a little bit about policy as code earlier. We also have that incorporated as part of our move processor. So there's this policy script that's essentially gonna make sure um, no policies uh, were not met when doing the move. And we have all these uh, policies defined in our Vega uh, open policy agent uh, repo. And here we see ones for hash elements, et cetera. There's one for vulnerabilities that says if we have any high severity vulnerabilities, not to promote that, that'd be like a log for J example. We also have an elements policy that says, oh, if there's a version mismatch, someone changed the element in Endeavor and we weren't expecting that, um, not to proceed with the move. So now we're going to make a change to this application. So, you know, the administrator likely set up those processors, but now as a developer, I'm going to make a change to this slick PD file. So go in and edit it. Come down, just update this to update account transaction one. And okay, I've, I've made my change. The uh, next piece. I'm going to do back out of here. I'm going to go to Slick App, which is our uh, manifest type, and I can uh, browse this. This has information that can be just in your config file. So it describes uh, the vendor broad Broadcom here. It describes the path to my private key, exactly what information I want to include in the SBOM. So this is defined, and this is ultimately. Uh, what's going to produce our, our SBOM. So I'm going to do a generate here. And this is what is going to produce that uh, SBOM document. And we'll do a list outputs. And we will go ahead and browse this member. And here we can see our generated SBOM, sort of similar to what I was uh, even showing on, on Tech Docs a, a moment ago. The other piece of this is this information was also written to our policy store. So we have this information for making future, uh, future policy decisions. All right, so I've made my change. We generated the SBOM. Now, just as an example, um, I'm gonna go back in here to 
uh, the Slick PD application, and I'm going to make another change. This could either be a mistake, or maybe somebody's trying to, you know, make a change just before I'm, you know, moving my application to the next stage and the like pre-prod or something like that. And I haven't yet got around to packaging my changes in Endeavor. Um, so here I've made this change to, to two. And now I'm going to um, try to package up my changes. So here I'm just going to create a package, give it a description. And select build package actions. And there's essentially two moves I want to do as part of this package. I want to do a move on the element I change, but I also want to do a move on the manifest file that I had I had generated. So I'm I'm doing a move with my SBOM alongside the software I'm I'm moving as part of this package. So I'm going to go ahead and cast this package now. Okay, so you can see that the cast is successful. The next part is I'm going to try to execute this move. And I expect this to fail because um, I didn't update my SBOM. So when the policy decision is looking at what the SBOM is versus what I'm actually promoting, there's gonna be a version mismatch. So here we see I have a return code 12. Um, I can inspect this output further to find um the library where the uh the policy decision was made and so let's find that really quick um so it's in this slick p1 sbom so if we just hop over to there uh, we'll see that I have this policy and that there was a version mismatch so that's why the um execute failed. Yeah, we can see that here in our in our actually actual policy code. And the next thing we would do is we can go regenerate our SBOM. So let's uh let's reset this package. All right, so we have our package reset. And we're going to go back to um, the Slick app manifest file. And we're going to regenerate it because we found out that that other change was intentional. It wasn't a bad actor and it wasn't a, a mistake. So we'll regenerate our SBOM. And then we just simply have to uh, recast and re execute our package. So here we're casting it, and then we're going to go ahead and execute it. And this time it's successful, right? Because the policy said that the versions had to match, and they did this time. Now that shows it working in Endeavor, and that's going to conclude sort of the demonstration I wanted to show today. But if you're interested in leveraging this as part of a pipeline as well, you can also refer to that blog that I, I linked to earlier. Um, it goes to describe how to do this in a in a Jenkins context as well, where Jenkins is essentially driving Endeavor. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending this webcast. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself, michael.bauer2 at broadcom.com or Greg McKinnon at broadcom.com as well. Thanks, Mike. We don't have any questions and we are at the top of the hour, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap. Thanks very much, everybody. And uh, thanks to Mike and Greg as well. Have a great day and rest of your week. All right, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.